Hey there, welcome to Board Game Hot Takes, the podcast where we give our immediate reactions to the hottest board games just minutes after playing them. My name is Tim. And this is Chris. This is Adam. And today, instead of giving a hot take review on a game we just finished playing, we're going to revisit our annual top games of all times list. So we've done this once a year since the show started. This is going to be our third annual top games of all times list. And we're going to do our top 40 games, which means we're going to do 10 games per episode over the next four episodes. So buckle in, everybody. It's going to be a little bit of a ride, but I'm excited to visit this. It's always fun to sit here and talk about some of our favorite games. It's also fun to talk about how wrong your choices are. I'm just kidding. Um, Before we jump into that, if you're a new listener to the show and we find that oftentimes we get some new listeners on these lists, um, every episode we start out with a little bit of a topic related to a poll question that I ask on social media. And we'd love for you to be part of the conversation. So if you'd like to join us and answer our poll or respond to the the poll, we may read some of your answers online. You can find us on Twitter at BG underscore hot takes or on Facebook on our board game hot takes Facebook group. So please join us. Give us your thoughts. Give us your answers. And we'll uh, read them out loud on the show. This week, I asked a question that Chris recommended. The question is, how do you express your board game love in public? The options I gave, number one, I don't, I hide it. 20% answered that way. Number two, I might wear a board game shirt was 59%. So pretty big numbers there. Only gamer clothes for me. So somebody who that's all they wear, 8%. Decent amount of really proud gamers out there. And my final answer I gave was board game face tattoo and we got 13 percent there and i'm starting to question the integrity of our polls with that answer but how did you guys answer this question how did you answer this question tim that's what i want to know okay so i might wear a board game shirt now i have to admit i've been a closeted nerd for most of my adult life i don't know why that is i've always been a nerd i've always been into fantasy and the science fiction a star wars nerd i was a toy collector i've been into comic books i love board games i used to play magic the gathering and I mostly tried to hide it most of my life, but I'm, I'm accepting and I'm getting old enough to feel secure in my, in, you know, in who I am. And now I, the first thing I do at a party is, Hey, do you, you're interested in board games? I'm like selling the, <laughs> I'm selling it to people. Nice. So I'm kind of outing myself now and I'm more likely to be wearing a board game shirt these days, usually with a board game media, some channel that I really like, or some podcast that I really like, uh, maybe a publisher that I really like. So I do have a decent collection of board game shirts at this point. And I'm happy to go public with them. I tend to pick shirts that maybe aren't so obvious. They don't say things like like have meeples on them or board games. They might have a cool symbol from a game I like because I love it when I'm walking down the street and I see somebody do a double take and I knew I can see it in their eyes that they know what it is, but they can't believe that this middle-aged guy walking down the street is wearing that shirt that they recognize. What shirt is it? What symbol? I need to know what symbol specifically you're talking about that where these board games get... I know the one. I had a, a a scythe shirt from the Fenris faction yeah. at one point, and I remember walking down the street in Long Beach, and some there was some young kids, probably in their twenties, and they're walking by, and one of the guys like does a double take, and he's like he's following me, he's like his eyes are following me down. So I was like that guy, that guy played scythe. He wanted to come talk to you, but he's too embarrassed to be like, dude, <laughs> I know what shirt that is. <laughs> he's like, who's that? What's that old dude wearing the shirt? <laughs> so Tim, you said you're just outing yourself now. You mean you don't think you started outing yourself a couple years ago when you started doing a board game <laughs> podcast? Well, I. No, listen, I mean, exactly. But but that's not public. That's to our, that's to hobbyists. That's the fan. Like <laughs> people who are already board game fans, I love talking to. But honestly, I did start this several years ago. Like I, when I really got into this hobby, I really, I would be at a party and I'd be like, oh, was, what are you into? Oh, you're into sports. That's cool. Hey, do, have you ever tried a, a board game related to sports? Because I've got one at home that you might want to give a shot. Maybe, <laughs> why don't you come over? I mean, Chris, like how long did it take me for to, to for me to invite you to board games after I met you in this, you know, kind of random social situation? God, I don't remember. It must have been uh, at least a year, maybe. I don't even think it was that long, to be honest. I think we get to know each other. And almost as soon as I really got pulled into the hobby, I was like, yeah, hey, Chris, you want to do a game night with me and this other guy? That's yeah, so, you might be right. So, what about you guys? Do you do you show publicly that you're gamers um, or nerds in any way? I have, I think, exactly one board game related shirt, and it's board game hot takes our logo. And I seldom wear. I was bold enough to wear it to my daughter's soccer a couple Saturdays ago, and I was I was like looking around and like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Nothing happened. Nobody knew what it was. No. <laughs> But yeah, I think I like the shirt itself and I think our symbol is cool. So I'm going to start wearing that one out 
and about more, trying to get some people asking me, what is that thing? I'm a little closeted too, Tim. I haven't opened myself to the world about my board game hobby, but I'm starting to with my friend the other night. The subject came up. I've told him about the podcast and he goes, I can't believe at the pool party last week, I didn't tell everybody that you have a board game podcast. And I was like, no, I'm not saying... But that was in a smaller company and I opened up about it and uh, everybody seemed to receive it well. And they're like, oh, so we thought you were just the, the jock dude, but turns out you're one of us. And I was like, oh, this is a good <laughs> sign. I'm, I'm glad we made it here. So yeah, in general, no board game face tattoos yet, but uh, I'm thinking our logo would look pretty good across <laughs> this grill right here. <laughs> nice. It's so fun talking to you kids because I think I'm the only one in our group that's firmly crossed over into the, I have no concerns about showing my geekiness. <laughs> I've, I've made it made it to that age where I just don't care anymore at all. I'm willing to tell anybody that has any interest. But the reality is I'm my answer is the same as Adam's, which is I might wear a board game t-shirt and, and yours too, Tim. Uh, and mostly that's just because I don't wear a lot of t-shirts with pictures on them. <laughs> it's not like, you know, philosophy or, you know, not wanting to show my colors. But I do have um, I do have our board game podcast shirt, which I love to wear. And I'll wear that quite a bit. What actually makes me feel good is that I got a um, uh, on our swag site. I got one for my wife, too. And she wears hers more often than I wear mine. So that that's a nice thing. But I've also got a board game hot takes mug. And I've got uh, a couple of beer glasses that have uh, board game hot takes on them. So uh, I actually wish that I had more stuff with some you know material from other podcasts that I enjoy and from you know, publishers and games and things like that. But I just never seem to get around to getting it. Yeah, I've got a few other shirts from some friends podcasts and show or like YouTube channels. But I also, um, you know, like I got Thinker Themer because they just have a cool logo. And I was like, nobody's going to know what that is, but I know and I'll feel good about it. And it was a cool, you know, it's a cool design. So I got a t-shirt from them as well. So I've got a handful. Um, yeah, I mean, Chris, I'm I'm right on board with you there. Like I'm getting to the point where I'm like, who cares? And how am I going to meet other gamers if, if I don't advertise myself a little bit? So let's just do this. But it's funny too that you said your wife wears your shirt and you're, you like that because my wife, I got her a hoodie and she's like, she wears it all the time. And my daughter, nice. she's wearing her like hoodie or her t-shirt out all the time. But Adam, I wear my board game hot takes gear out pretty regularly. It's like the one thing I wear religiously. Nobody's ever even asked what, what yeah. it means or anything. I don't think people look that close at a logo, right? It kind of just looks like a it's dice, right? It's like, oh, you must be like a casino guy or it's just some random brand logo. So... I don't think unless somebody recognized it that they would ever call it. I've worried it to like board game meetups or to to conventions and nobody's said a thing about it. So well someday, someday somebody will ask about it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe someday. Maybe maybe we'll get big enough at some point. I'm gonna read a couple of answers that some people responded. So Seth Gonzalez, big friend of the show, said, I wear my board game hot takes t-shirt in public and especially when I'm out gaming with friends. And I responded and said that was the best answer here. It is. Uh, Little J Game said, none of the none of the above. I just say random seeming things like, oh, that's such a Nizia deal. Or I wonder <laughs> nice. what Sid Saxon would do in this situation. <laughs> that's perfect. That's so good. And uh, <laughs> Jeff LaFlam said, I think most of my shirts are now board game shirts. I think I'm doing it right. You could see from the answer that a lot of people have at least some shirts and and you know like wearing them on. I think it's it's fun to engage with Abby. In any case, we don't talk about it a whole lot, but we actually do. You can get board game hot takes gear if you're interested. We don't make any money on it, and that's intentional. Like, it's just there in case you're a fan and you'd like to wear it and, you know, kind of share it with friends, whatever. You can go to the boardgamehottakes.com website and just go to the uh, merchandise link on there, and it'll bring you right to our Redbubble store. And you can buy gear there. Like I said, we don't make any money on it. We're not trying to pitch it to you, but would love it if you share it with your friends or whatever. So if you're a fan of the show, help yourself. It's a fun logo to have. These t-shirts are super nice. I like wearing them. Let's jump into the topic about our top 40 games of all time. I'm so excited to kick this off. This is some of our favorite episodes every year. This year, we're going to expand it a little bit. Last year, we did our top 30 games. This year, we're going to do our top 40. So today, we're starting with number 31 to 40 in reverse order. So we're going to start with our 40th first. But I always like to ask you guys, how was this list for you this year? Did it change a lot? Did you did you have a hard time getting 40? How do you feel about the the experience of building this list this year? Well, Tim, for my list, it was a little bit different, I think, than last year in that I think I saw a noticeable trend towards 
lighter rules overhead with more depth of strategy. I think I was moving to that last year and then there was a big shift this year in that I added, so use a pub meeple. I added 57 games to be ranked 57 games, made it into the algorithm for me to compare. And after 20 minutes of clicking here or clicking there, picking which one and heartbreak and, Oh, how can I pick which game here? These games are too different. How can I pick one? So I made it through and I got my list and I'm, very, very happy with how it ended up. I, you know, did reserve the right to shift here and there or to add a game in that I forgot to mention, or there's always something that slips through the cracks. So by no means is this my final etched in stone list. I guess it is for another year now, but I'm pretty happy with what came out of the pub meeple ranking engine. So I'm going to start with an objection. I kind of object to calling this top 40 games of all time because, I mean, the fact that we're doing this every year, so it ought to be the same ones every year, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did the exact same thing that Adam did. I ranked the games. And what that really means is that this is what's on my mind right now. This is what I feel like playing. These are the games I'm thinking about. These are the games that make me feel enthusiastic. Yeah. And I actually did almost 100 games, and I had no problem finding that many that I felt at least a little bit enthusiastic about. So that was actually a really fun thing to do, other than the fact that it took me like an hour to click through all the different iterations of that. And last year, I did a little bit of manipulation, doing things like pulling out some lighter games because... You know, I didn't feel like they really stacked up uh, fairly against some heavier games. This year, I didn't really do that. I just really went with trying to do the best idea, you know, try to do the best job I could of figuring out what would I want to play right now if I was sitting down at a table. And if there's some wonky results because, you know, Star Realms ends up right next to Barrage, then so be it. That's half of the fun of doing this because right now I've... Although that's actually not true. <laughs> but um, but there, there were some surprise answers in there to me. And I, to me, that's half of the fun of making the list. So you know, I don't take it too seriously, but it, I think this is a pretty good yardstick of what I'm feeling interested in and happy about and excited about playing right now. Yeah, we mentioned Pub Meeple a couple of times here. So those of you that are listening don't know what that is. You can go to this website, pubmeeple.com, and it has ranking engines. And one of the things you can rank on there are board games. And so you can go there and you can either just add games manually, but you can import your collection of games that you've rated on Board Game Geek, which is the easiest way to get started, and then pick ones to rank. And what it'll do is it'll show you two side by side, and you click which one you like the most, and then it kind of keeps going you through this ranking thing. And so it's a fun way to kind of just like, I don't know how accurate it is, because when I look at my final list, although I love all these games, I think there are a couple that I'm like, I don't even remember those two being compared against each other. So I don't know how accurate it is, but it's a fun experience to go through. I started with 160 games on this list. And I have to be honest, like I look at this 160 games in this list and I was surprised how low some of them ended up falling. And many of them, I would have been happy if they showed up in my top 40. I just, there's a lot of wonderful games out here. So my top 40 list is the games that I'm most excited about right now. And I think I'll be excited about for a long time, but also, there's so many other great games and so many that I haven't even played yet, but out of the games that I have played, tons and tons of great games. The only manipulation I made to my list after I finished it was if it was a game I'd only played once, I pushed it down. And there was only a couple that fell kind of at the high end of my list that I think could raise once I get a chance to play them more and I plan to play them more. But I didn't want to rate, I didn't want to include anything in this list that I'd only played once. Doesn't mean you guys have to follow that rule, but that's just what I did. Because I thought it was good to show some love to these games that I played multiple times and still really enjoy. The one other thing we're going to change this year, after we talk about a game, I want you guys to tell me what is your one favorite thing about this game. It can be a mechanism, it can be the theme, it can be something about the artwork, it can be anything at all, but what is the one thing that makes this game stand out to you? And I did want to mention there was one other thing that I had. Chris mentioned how it's kind of challenging to like have Star Realms in there compared against Barrage. My toughest choices here were about some games that are solo only games. Because to be honest, like my favorite gaming experience is going to be with friends around the table. And it was hard for me to rank a game that I think is a, just a fantastic solo game that I play by myself when I have, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes on a Friday night and nothing to do versus I can sit down with you guys. So that was really tough. But I do have a couple solo games that kind of made it into my ranking list here. And I just I don't know how that can be accurate. So I just want to call that out now. It doesn't mean that I would prefer to play solo than I would prefer to play something else. But some of these games just like get me so excited when I think about them, even if it's 
going to be playing by myself. So that was the one really quirky thing about comparing these games to me. But Adam, you're right. There was some heartbreak in there. There were some, there were some like games that I'm like, how can I pick the best of these two games? They're so, they're both, I, I love them both and I have no idea how to pick the two of them. There was, there was a number of those. So that was fun to go through. So Tim, you're going to kick us off with your, uh, do you have some honorable mentions? You're going to kick us off at number 40. Where are you going to start here? You know, why don't I start with just a couple that I pushed down the list a little bit. You know, as I ranked these, they fell a little bit higher, but I decided not to include them because I've only had one play of them. And most of these are fairly recent games. And so the first one that I want to mention was Tyletum. This is a one of the Italian design games. Mechanically was such a wonderful game. Thematically was pretty dull. And so just because of how much fun I had playing around with the mechanisms here, I want to go back to it so bad. And it I kept beating out other games that I was ranking against it. So it ended up landing like right at 40. I think it could raise if I play it more, but I also could feel like it doesn't stand out. So we'll see. I want to play that one some more. The other one that landed just a little bit higher was, was Woodcraft. This is a Vladimir Succi game. And Wow, this was a super fun, interesting um, game about about trying to uh, you know collect resources and fill orders. And I don't even like filling orders in games, but this one just did it in such an interesting way. Can't wait to play this one. Where I could definitely see if I get a chance to play this one some more that it will get a little bit higher on my list. The last one I just want to mention, which you heard us talk about last week, was Darwin's Journey, which I think is a brilliant game, and I. I need to get that back to that one because I don't I don't know that it'll make it on this list here. Adam's already like smirking and rolling his eyes over here. But I think if I play it more, I think it's going to be a love for me. I think it's a game that I'm going to want to go back to some more. But I'm not going to put it on this list. And it, I didn't even, it, I kind of did this list before we even did the review, before we played and reviewed it. So it didn't make it into my ranking here. But I feel like if I didn't at least mention it after that really wonderful play of it, that I would, uh, I would be remiss. So... After those honorable mentions of some recent new games, I'm going to start off with my number 40. It's a game that just bubbled up because I dropped a couple of the other ones down. And this is Arkham Horror, the card game. Arkham Horror, the card game is uh, published by Fantasy Flight Games. And it is a, uh, it's it's an interesting thematic, but completely card-based game where you're essentially, the the, the first scenario, there's one card out on the table And it says, you're in your office and the door disappears. What do you do? And right from there, it it just drives this theme of this weird, strange things that are happening going on. And it's got some, you know, kind of abstract mechanisms, like you basically have to to do this investigate action. And if you are successful, then you're going to put clues on there. If you get enough clues, then all of a sudden you flip a card over and now the next, the, another room reveals itself and you're moving to that room and maybe there's a monster in there. And the way that you're doing kind of skill checks here is that each character has their own skills, but you're pulling chips out of a bag. It's kind of a, a like a, kind of like a bag builder, but it's, it's a, a bag that's preset. And if you are lucky and you pull a positive one and it matches up with your skills, then maybe you'll meet that skill check and you'll be successful. If you're not, and it happens a lot, you fail, then you got to deal with the negative consequences and, you know, fight that monster again or run away or whatever. It's very tense. Um, It's very challenging. It's a great solo game, which is the only way way I've played it. But this might be one of those rare cooperative games that I think I'd enjoy because there's not really a good way to quarterback in it. Everybody's got a handful of cards and your actions are oftentimes just to play a card and do what it says. And so you're kind of making decisions on your own. And I just think it tells a great story. I've only been through the original campaign, but I bought a second one. I want to play it somewhere. So this game, I, I'm, I'm excited to go back to it a lot. Um, I think this game could stick around for a bit, but it's, it's a game that I, I've really enjoyed so far. And I think it adds some fun theme. My favorite thing about Arkham Horror, the card game, the individual characters and their decks, they're pre-built decks, but you can kind of expand on those. And I just like that every character feels very different. It, it, it plays very different. Every time you're playing with a different character, the, the cards you're going to draw are going to make you feel like, hey, you've got different skills. You've got different abilities here. You're going to be able to respond to this situation in a different way. And I, and I like that about this game a lot. So Arkham Horror, the card game is my number 40 game on my list. Great pick, Tim. I'll give a couple honorable mentions, games that just fell off the back and some reasons why. Dune, original Dune. Basically, you have to play it at six players, so that's a little prohibitive right there. I think the combat's one of the funnest with your offensive weapon, your defensive weapon, and your your leader or how many troops you're going to bid, how much spice you're going to pay. I think that's a fun kind of combat system, and just going through the different phases every round of that game gives me some good feelings. But 
you know, it's hard to get it to the table. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a game I suspect we'll be hearing about more, La Granja, just off the top 40, which is a fantastic game that I've been introduced to because of Board Game Arena. Love playing that one. Airland and Sea, a quick light card game. I really love that game too. Man, these games are great. I don't know how they didn't make my top 40. <laughs> Cinch, right. which I loved, you guys didn't like, but that's a little bit too much algebra for some people, but not for me. <laughs> and then Distilled, another game I was introduced to at mm-hmm. uh, Sedona Con. I had a lot of fun playing that one, but didn't make my top 40. So what did make my top 40? A game that I can see Chris rolling his eyes at already. This is High Society by Rainier Kinesia. It's a, Chris is shaking his head, of course, a quick, (laughs) light card game, low rules overhead. All you're doing, there's about 13 or 14 of these cards that everybody's going to bid on from their hand of, I think it's $96 that's totaled together in different uh, denominations. You've got $1 through $10, and then it's like, I don't know, a 12, a 15, a 20, and a 25, something weird like that, some weird denominations of this hand of cash you're going to use to make these auctions on these different cards. Some of the, most of the cards are good one through 10 and there's a couple multipliers. So times two. So your score at the end of the round is, you know, the, the face value of all these cards that you've collected and there's a couple negative ones. So in that case, the first person to pass the auction loses and has to take the negative card and everybody else, whatever the rules are pretty simple. There's a little twist with these two different types of auctions for the positive cards and for the negative cards. And then you add your points together from all the cards you've won during that auction. If you have the highest points, you win unless you've spent the most money during the game. You've overspent. Now you're poor. You can't be part of this high society that you're trying to get into in the first place. And you're out. Nobody wants to hang with the poor guy. Get out of here. Um, So that's the Keynesian twist in this case, which usually those can irk me. But here I find it pretty interesting, pretty simple to understand. The most fun thing about this game to me is that thought, looking at other people's hands. Oh, what did they bid? How much money do they have left? How much do I have left? I like that bit of interaction and looking around and just the considerations there for how much you're going to bid versus how much you're going to hold back and keep in your hand. High Society, I think it's a fantastic game. Oh, it's going to be a long night. <laughs> well, before Chris moves in here, I just want to point out that that I like that you picked this. And I mentioned I've had 160 games that I ranked, but out of all the games I've ever ranked on Board Game Geek, it was like 690. So this 160 is kind of the top tier for me. It's a, it's top 20%. And High Society was in that list. So I, I remember because as I was going through this ranking engine, I kept, it kept coming up against stuff and I was enjoying the game. Maybe the only reason that it fell a little bit for me was because Ra does some of the same things. And I like that a lot. Terrible at both of them personally. And Ra, you know, was a little bit higher than that, but great pick Adam. Thanks. Yeah. It takes all kinds, man. <laughs> so I'm going to start by giving you guys numbers 41 through 45, just so you can get a sense of how eclectic this list was and just some of the really strong titles that didn't actually make it into the top 40, which just goes to show how much fun the top 40 was. So number 45 was Cthulhu Death May Die. Number 44 was that crowd favorite, Root. Number 43 was Imhotep. Number 42, the Dark Horse favorite, Nadavalier. And number 41 was Ankh, Gods of Egypt, which I almost kicked up to higher in the list just on matter of principle because it is a great Eric Lang classic. But I tried to stay true to the list as uh, provided to me by Pub Meeple. So those didn't make the list, but here is where the list starts for me. And that's number 40 and a game that will be very familiar to listeners of the show because we just reviewed it last week and Tim actually just talked about it. It was Darwin's Journey, which is designed by Simone Luciani and Nestor Mangone and is published by Thunder Griff Games. This is a highly thematic Euro that Adam really didn't like, but that (laughs) I really did like. And um, basically you're, you're moving through the Galapagos Islands along with Charles Darwin and the HMS Beagle trailing along behind him trying to be a good little helper, exploring islands, finding specimens, sending them back to the museums in Europe, controlling some area with uh, by putting lots of stamps on envelopes because, you know, that's one way to get really aggressive with people is put lots of stamps on your envelope. <laughs> It'll show those suckers who's who. You should write a yeah, letter. I'm going to write a letter and put lots of stamps on it. That'll show, that'll show them. 
This game, I had a great time with it. I love the way that it incorporated the theme and some pretty solid gameplay. But my favorite thing about this game was the fact that you've got something that's a heavy, complex Euro game. It's weighted at 3.8 on BGG. And yet we got into this game so fast. Turns were a flash unless you ask Adam and when he'll tell you that they were like, you know, at the, uh, you know, glacier this speed game took forever. Guys. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but we made it through this heavy game in, in like two and a half hours. And I thought it was a pleasure from start to finish. So I think just the, the breeziness and efficiency of this highly complex game really made it a standout. And that's not even getting into all the fun that was to be had in making interesting decisions and just doing some neat stuff in a, in a very highly thematic game. So I thought that was, um, who knows, maybe next year it'll be higher if I get a chance to play this one again. But for now, it's number 40. Awesome, Chris. And by the way, the all, all of your uh, honorable mentions, there were all in my ranking engine. Yes, even including Ruth, because I do think that there is a lot to be said for that game if you can sit through and learn it and and deal with that. But um, so I'll, I'll talk about my number 39 now. And this is a game that I've played with Chris more than anybody on the planet. And probably it will always be Chris more than anyone on the planet. And that is Star Realms. Uh, Star Realms is a game that I got introduced to on the app like five or six years ago and loved it and bought the physical game. And I played it with my wife and her and I, I remember I have memories of playing with Danielle after I taught her the physical game, but we were traveling in India. And I remember like being in a hotel, taking a break from a long, hot day out, walking around and seeing tours. And we're like, okay, we're sitting in this, you know, in this, this hotel lobby, let's just bust out some star realms. I, I have a memory of playing that in India, in Delhi. Um, but, but, you know, I introduced it to Chris and he loved it right away. And we started playing on the app together. And I think he mentioned a couple weeks ago on Twitter that he's played that game like over 11,000 times. I don't know how many times I played it, but it's gotta be in the thousands at this point. I just played a game with Chris today. Always a fun game. I think it would probably be higher, honestly, if I just didn't play it so much, you know, some games just they're, they're great. They're always fun, but they lose their novelty. And so it's probably just lacking a little bit of novelty or it would probably be much higher on my list. Storms is always a fun experience. It's quick. It's, it's fun decisions. Yes. Sometimes you get blown out because of bad luck, but it's a 10 minute game. And so you just get back in and play it again. So star realms is my number 39. What a great pick. Uh, I'm going to have some more to say that, about that coming up soon, but did you say what your favorite thing was about star realms, Tim? You know what? I didn't. It's it's the three simple icons that that guide almost all of the actions. I think the, the a deck builder that doesn't require you to read a lot of text, and yet is still a lot of fun. I think they pulled that off in a way that I haven't experienced a deck builder before or after that quite hit that mark. Even the even its like successors like Hero Realms got a little bit wordy. Things like um, Shards of Infinity got a little bit wordy, and Star Realms just. It, it's somehow it's still fun with those three simple icons that are that dictate most of the actions you're taking. You know, Tim, I've got to say, this is the one game, the one game that I pulled from my list specifically because it just felt unfair to every other game. Because you know, <laughs> it is true, eleven thousand games. It Star Realms transcends this list to me. I if I left it on there, it would just be number one through forty. <laughs> so I so I didn't even put it in my list, but a clearly one that belongs in any list of great games. Uh, shocked that it's not on your list at all, Chris, but uh, I'm glad you called that out. Okay, my number 39 game is Planted. Planted colon, a game of nature, nature and nurture. It's a game by Phil Walker Harding that my stepdaughter picked up, saw it at Target. She picked it up for me. I was not expecting much at all, but this is a fantastic game draft and pass game there's only four rounds you're going to get a hand of i think it's seven cards first and third round you're going to pass to the left after you pick a card second and fourth round you pass to the right easy way to get the players involved i love the theme here house plants it's just a beautiful theme beautiful art i want all of these plants all over my house i want to smell oxygen i feel like i'm smelling oxygen coming from these cards when i play Look at these components, everybody. The sun is beautiful. There's water droplets. The barrage can learn a couple lessons from. This. <laughs> these things stand up and they're giant and they're visible. There's little leaves, there's green thumbs, and there's squirt bottles that you got to feed your plants with. You can draft just straight up house plants from the, uh, from the board. You can draft resources and you can draft in-game scoring cards or multipliers, boosters, ongoing um, effects that'll boost your cards in your hand. 
a great game, a quick little engine builder drafting game. One that Sarah and I have been playing repeatedly because it is surprisingly fun. Give it a shot. That's Planted, a game of nature and nurture. What's your favorite thing about it, Adam? Oh, favorite thing about it? It's the art. And the feeling that I get from seeing these plants, I have about, I don't know, a half of these, not probably not half, a bunch of these plants that are in my house, a bunch of other ones I've seen around, a bunch of other ones I'm looking at. And I'm like, dude, I want to get this one in my house because it's gorgeous. So it helps me learn and the art just brings me in and and that kind of makes me want to learn about this stuff and it makes the game that much more enjoyable. I remember you talking about this one on an on the table segment and it just, it sounds like a lot of fun. I'd love to try this one. It's great. So coming in at number 39 for me was Scythe designed by Jamie Stegmeier and published by Stonemeyer Games. This one might be a bit of a surprise, not because it's on the list, but because it dropped down from number 22 last year on my list down to number 39. And there's a reason for that. We've played a couple of games of this since the last time we did this list. And in those games, I identified what I found was a little bit of a weakness. And that was uh, a couple times playing it and getting completely shocked by somebody else winning in ways that I thought wasn't very exciting, like how, you know, massing a lot of coins or basically if it, there were ways of winning that were not as highly thematic or as interesting as I would like them to be. And and that detracted for a little bit from the game. And I hadn't seen that previously. Previously, I'd seen people winning by taking over lots of territory or by accomplishing a lot of goals. And so a little bit of a ding, but it's still on the top 40 list. It's number 39 because this game is still a ton of fun. I love the actions. I love the, uh, the the engine building of this game, and I won't get into a lot of detail on the specifics of this because we've talked about this so much, including a review that we did not very long ago at all. It was just a few weeks ago. But essentially, this is a somewhat area control, somewhat Euro game set in a, a alternative universe 1920s Europe where there are steampunk mechs and all kinds of neat things. But this game is still uh, super fun. It dropped a little bit for me, but not a whole lot. And one of the reasons why this game stays so evergreen for me is because of my favorite part, which is the art by Jakob Brzezalski, which it is some of the best board game art I've ever seen. These pictures of mechs traversing the countryside in a 1920s Europe just is so evocative and entertaining and it's an absolute delight to look at. And so this game will probably be on my list forever. Uh, And part of that is the art. So that is my number 39 scythe. Art's so awesome in this game. So fun. So my number 38 game is a Stonemaier release as well. Uh, but this is designed by Paolo Mori, and this is Libertalia Winds of Gale Crest. When I've got four to six people that just want to hang out and have a couple of drinks and chill out and just have some fun, Libertalia Winds of Gale Crest is my number one favorite game I want to go and do that with at this point. Um, it would probably be a little bit higher for me, except it's been kind of a mixed bag for the people that I've played it with of how much people enjoyed it. I've loved it. A few other people I've played it with have loved it. It's this fun little mix of like surprise reveal. Everyone starts with the same six cards, these pirates in your hands. You're going to play them out on the island at the same time. And depending on the number that's on it and the, uh, the, or, you know, kind of the player or the reputation you've got, which one's going to trigger first. And it's going to, you know, kind of create all these interesting effects that happen. But ultimately what you're trying to do is be the most powerful pirate that goes to the island and get the best loot on it. But it's kind of a fun little, it's got a little bit of strategy, a little bit of surprise, a little bit of push your luck. Oh, I think they're going to do this, but what if they don't, you know? Um, And I just have fun with it. I think the original version of Libertalia was also fun, but I love the new production and I love some of the variability that the new Winds of Galecrest version adds to it. I love the new reputation track versus the old tiebreakers. But I really like playing this game and I'm always giddy when I'm sitting there playing it like, oh, I just pulled out this pirate and got you guys. And maybe 50% of the people at the table are like, that was really cool. And the other 50% are like, this game is weird. We're just playing the same six cards. I don't understand. So it's, it's like it would probably be higher if this hit for more people. But I have fun with it. And when I when the whole table is into it, it is a blast to play. Now, 
I know that Chris and Adam have played this. Adam, you and I reviewed this on an episode with Riley Riley Stock. Uh, Chris, you've only played it like async on Board Game Arena, the original version, which is a terrible way to play this game. But I think that this is a game. I I didn't bring it to Sedona Con because you guys weren't super hot on it. I honestly think that you guys would have a fun time with this if we're just sitting around looking for a 30, 45 minute fun game to play. So I think I'm probably going to bring this to our next convention and see if I can pull it out when we just want something a little bit lighter because I really have fun with this game. I think it's a blast. My favorite part about Libertalia Winds of Gale Crest, I think it's got to be just the, um, I think it's got to be the, the the variety that happens here. Like you, there's 40 cards in this deck. You're only going to see I think 18 of them in every game. And so every game feels very different. The pirates that come up, the way they interact with each other, the way they interact with the loot. I love when a game just makes a game experience feel very different every time you play. You have to think of different strategies. You have to plan a different way. And Libertalia, for a very light game, does does that pretty well. And so Libertalia Winds of Galcrest is my number 38. I got to admit, Tim, that Winds of Galcrest is going to hit some headwinds with me <laughs> based on my limited experience on BGA. But I would I would definitely be willing to try this one, especially the re-implementation of it. Yeah, I think the way you described it, Tim, uh, the way you want to play it is a few guys just hanging out, have a couple drinks, and just have a, a chaotic time of fun, just silly shenanigans here and there. I want to say my favorite thing about this game is... When you go into a round with a strategy or you want to play a card and you're thinking this is actually going to happen, and then that thing actually happens. It's like a miracle. It's like a <laughs> one in two billion. You're like, wait a minute, that actually worked? So that's one of my favorite things about this. That was a fun pick, Tim. All right, my number 38 game is Mosaic, A Story of Civilization. I'm breaking Tim's rule here. I've only played it the one time when we reviewed it. This is a game by Glenn Drover, and it's uh, it's a newer one. It was in 2022, Forbidden Games as a publisher. But we played it. I was looking forward to playing this one. It has a lot of things I enjoy. It has kind of this tag collecting system, like in Terraforming Mars or Arc Nova. I think it's really well done here. It has these different streams of card markets, and that's what you're doing your actions from for the majority of the game is you know seeing which card. They all kind of do a little bit similar but slightly different things so which one's going to work best for you in this different situation and then it has this area majority is region scoring the, there's no like brutal mean combat where you're taking anybody out for the most part it's just kind of get your guys here get control of the area i like the different phases of the scoring although we noted in the review those might cluster together and really hose you if you're not having a great game Mosaic is the name. The whole board is done these little mosaic shards, and a lot of the cards have these mosaics in the background to kind of try to fit that in. Only played it the one time. I had a blast playing it. I got my butt kicked at it, but I thought it was enjoyable. I thought there was a lot interesting there. I love how you seed the board first. You're pretty much done doing all the work at that point. Every time you put something down, you're just gobbling stuff up, getting more tags, getting more little bonuses as you're putting stuff out there. I had a blast playing this one. I like to go back and try it again. Chris, you noted that you know your list was a lot about games that have made you think about them more recently. Mine is similar. This is one of those games that has provoked my thought, and I'm intrigued right now. I want to discover it more. I want to see the different ways this game spreads out and opens up. So a few of the games on my list that I haven't played a prolific number of times, or even just one time like this one, is because it has ignited that spark and makes me want to explore the game and figure out what's going on there. That's Mosaic, A Story of Civilization. Before Chris jumps in, this was a this was actually in my ranking as well, and it ranked pretty high. It ended up at 52 for me, and I think it could go either way, right? I mean, a couple more plays, and I could be loving this game, or a couple more plays, maybe it starts to feel stale. I'm not really sure where it's going to fall, but I definitely want to experience it some more. And it's notable in that this is the game when we got together in Sedona Con for like the week before, and I was like, hey, can anyone find Mosaic anywhere? We should get Mosaic and get it played. And he was like, he's like, Tim, there's about two hours away from you. There's a store that has Mosaic in it. He's like trying to get me to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> we go so clearly Adam's very excited about Mosaic. I would like to go back to it as well. And Chris, I think you'd enjoy this game. I know you didn't get to play it with us, but uh, yeah, Mosaic's a fun game. Hopefully we all get to get back together and try it, try it out again. Yeah. yeah, I would love to try that one. And I'm sorry that I missed that episode. I wish I could have joined you guys for that one, but I would love to play it if anybody can get their hands on a copy of it. Tim, it's on the store is only two hours <laughs> away by the end of this podcast. Yeah, right. 
Um, and I totally get Adam, what you're saying about the, you know, the things that are on your mind. I mean, that's, you know, that that's half of the fun of the list is just like, what's making me excited at this moment. Uh, and speaking of exciting, uh, my number 38 was can't stop by Sid Saxon published originally, believe it or not, by Parker Brothers. Uh, the other funny thing about this is I'm looking at the BGG page right now, and it lists about 10 artists, including Clemens Franz on this one, which I'm kind of scratching my head about because there's no art in this game. So I'm not sure what these artists were drawing that were you know, involved in this production. But anyway, super simple game. This thing is rated like a one on BGG. It's incredibly simple. Basically, you have these tracks from two to 12 and you roll four dice and you basically have to put out uh, combinations made out of those numbers that you've got. And you have three tokens to put out. So each turn, you're allowed to move three numbers up one of those tracks if you keep rolling them. And each roll, you either are able to move one of those buttons up the track or you can if you can't you bust so there's a huge element of push your luck here i have been playing this game a lot on bga because it is a super breezy fast play easy to do you don't have to pay any attention you can just go on there pop in take a couple turns and it's it's easy to do i actually enjoyed it so much on bgg that i went out and bought a hard copy of this one that I played with my family a bunch of times and everybody loves this game. It's super fun. Probably played it a couple hundred times now between live plays and plays on BGG. But it's a quick, easy play, lots of fun. And that's probably my favorite thing about it is a combination of the push your luck is one thing that I really love about it. It's just straight push your luck. It is nothing but push your luck. And that's a lot of fun. And the other is just how much simple, quick, exciting fun it is to play this game. And that's how it landed at 38 on my list. This is a great pick, Chris. And this was this was ranked high for me as well. This ended up at 73 on my list. And it I gotta be honest, like I think there's a lot of really wonderful games that are a little bit lighter that when I'm comparing them, when I think of a great game night, I think of a heavier game a lot of the time for myself. And so I think I unfairly rated some heavier games compared to lighter games that I know they're wonderful games. I know they bring me a lot of joy, but they just don't get me as excited for a game night. And so Can't Stop is one of those games that probably would have been higher if I truly ranked the joy that I got out of it. Can't Stop is also a game that I know my mom and dad listen to this show. Hi, mom and dad. This is a game that they introduced me to when I was probably seven or eight years old. I've been playing this game almost my whole life. And it's wonderful to see this resurgence. I'm now playing with my family, my mom and my dad, my brother. We have an ongoing can't stop game going on board game arena now. We're playing together. I love it. I can never win this game. <laughs> it's push your luck. I can have a seven, a, like a five, a seven, and a nine, and I can't roll three times without busting. Like I'm so bad at this game. <laughs> I don't understand it. I, I feel like I'm playing like Adam will play with us and he'll just like roll until he just wins all three columns without ever stopping. And I can never do the best numbers more than three times. I don't know what's wrong with my luck, but uh can't stop is a fantastic pick, Chris. Great to see it on your list here. Adam's got a spreadsheet, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I have no spreadsheet. I just have an incredible, intuitive knowledge of what's going to happen, and I always do seem to like beat you guys. Whenever you, you guys don't invite me anymore, because I always win against you guys. <laughs> I was so. telling my brother about this. We we were talking about it because my dad wins all the time on this. They were like, "Oh, he won another game." And the thing about can't stop is that I feel like every single time I say, "Oh, I should probably stop now." No, I'm going to do one more time. I bust I every single time I think that in my head. Now, <laughs> I may just be remembering those moments, but I swear to God, it's like, you know, your brain knows like, okay, you just pushed it too far. You better stop now. But you got to do it one more time. Yeah. It's so interesting how that it like 100% of the time. So the one game I won with my family recently, I was like, every time I got that gut instinct, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and stop now. And I did. I ended up crushing them <laughs> but i can't do it most of the time most of the time i can't just i can't stop it's that's the reality of it my number 37 game is cthulhu death may die this is a eric lang design eric lang and rob davio uh design uh this is uh, put up by come on games and this has got a funny history for me because i remember when this game first came up on kickstarter and i just introduced chris to board gaming he was starting to play with me a bit but he didn't seem too enthusiastic about games but I knew he was an HP Lovecraft guy. And so I sent him a link and I was like, Chris, check out this Kickstarter that's out. And he got so he he backed it. He went all in, almost all in. He he backed it. And I was like, crap, now I'm going to have to play this stupid game with him. It's, it can't be good. 
and he got the Kickstarter. And I still remember the first day that he got it. And he was so enthusiastic and he busted it out and we spent the time setting it up. And it was such a fun game to play. And I've never not had a fun experience playing Cthulhu Death May Die. And uh, I actually just got a chance to play it again last week. I think I talked about last week's episode. But always fun. Um, the scenarios are, f- are funny and unique. There's a unique sense of humor. There's there's fun, exciting things that happen. And my absolute favorite thing about Cthulhu Death May Die is leveling up your characters. Every time that you get to a certain insanity level on this track, then you get to upgrade one of your character abilities. And it's such a fun choice. And your characters just get ridiculously overpowered by the end of the game. But it's always by the time when you're just about to die or you're just about to go insane. And so... Yeah, it just it's so fun to make those choices. Each character plays different. And I've got at this point, just with like the first two seasons of this game, I got like 25 characters that I just, you know, when I'm setting up the game, I just randomly choose one. And it, it just feels like a different experience every time. So Cthulhu Death May Die, I'm still having a fun time with it. It might be higher. I think last year was a little bit higher on my list. The game goes a little bit long sometimes for a fun like game. And so sometimes it drags just a tad at the end. But uh, this last time I played, I played it at like, last weekend with a friend and we finished a game in i don't know 70 minutes or something like that it was pretty quick perfect experience um cthulhu death may die is super fun for a cooperative game which i don't like a big dumb minis dice rolling game which i don't like but somehow i like this game so should check this one out great pick tim my number 37 game is brian baru high king of ireland this is one i forced the guys to play and it was met with um a decent amount of enjoyability i would say nothing nobody was super high on it nobody was super low on it but i this one intrigued me it stuck with me for some reason if i didn't say it's by pierce sylvester and osprey games i was a publisher and this is a an area control pseudo trick taking game based in ireland and with this uh former king of ireland as its titleman I won't go into it too much. There's the area control game on the main part of the board. Around the outside, you have these little mini games, Vikings, uh, the marriage track, the little monastery competition, and there's um, one other track I can't think of. But you're making all these trade-offs with the cards. Are you going to climb this track? Are you going to go for the area control points? Are you going to try to win the trick and get the good bonus? Which bonus are you going to try to get? So it's these series of these tight little trade-offs and not knowing exactly how those are going to work out. At least I am still in the discovery phase of how those little trade-offs are all going to pan out. What's the best way to go? So that is my favorite thing about Brian Baru. I think I was one of the ones who fell on the the pretty enthusiastic scale on this one, Adam. And um, just having been to Ireland just a couple of months ago, you can't step into a museum without reading about Brian Baru. Well, the interesting thing was that it sounds like he was a bit of a player and uh, a bit of a politician too. So, which is Probably, <laughs> probably hobbies in the game. Interesting guy. So that brings me to my number 37, which was Final Girl, designed by Evan Derrick and AJ Porfirio and published by Van Ryder Games. And this is the only solo only game on my list, I think. Uh, and it is a, a pretty unique, interesting game, in part because it is a solo only game. So In Final Girl, you play as the archetypal final girl of every horror movie that has ever been made in the history of horror movies. And your job is to take out the killer before the killer takes you out. And you're essentially moving around this board and doing all kinds of actions that are based on cards and then success rolls. And the slasher is controlled by an automa. And it's as simple as uh, you've got to take them out or they're going to take you out. But the thing that sets this game apart and makes it um, it's super exciting for me and my favorite thing about the game is its impeccable use of theme. This game is so theme heavy. I mean, it's basically, this game is, is all theme all the time. And it's a theme that I love. I grew up in the 80s watching all these horror movies and they pull out every trope in the book here. I think there's even a special box you can get that comes with all the different units. Well, actually, I should go back and say something about that, that there are, there's a core box that has a player character. And then there's these extra boxes, you know, episode boxes or feature film boxes, I think they call them, where you have uh, additional characters and you have additional killers and additional scenes. And every one is basically a 
rip off of some you know horror movie trope from the 80s like nightmare on elm street or aliens or friday the 13th so it, halloween halloween yeah, yeah it, it does all of those and it does it so well thematically and it, it is a super fun that enthusiasm game to play color. sit down you know grab a beer turn out the lights put on some scary music and you can have yourself a great solo game night with this one and that is my number 37. Yeah, Final Girl sounds really fun, Chris. It's, that's a game I, I, I make really excited to try out. One of my top solo want to play games. All right. So my number 36 game is a recent introduction, but it's a game I've played a lot. And it's an interesting game because it's it doesn't really fit with most of the other games on my list. This is Scout. Scout is a uh, recent published by Oink Games. It's a small card game. It feels like a lot of family weight games, things you grew up playing like Uno and all these little games you can find at Target or Walmart that are just simple little boxes of cards. And Scout looks like that. It feels like it, but somehow it rises above. Now, I like a lot of those games, to be clear, but this one, just from the first time I played it, I loved everything it was doing. It, it's it's so much fun to scout that one card out of the the play out, you know, out of the area in the middle and add it to your hand and then get to make a big hand later, do it a couple turns in a row and, r- row and kind of build up this hand. So yeah, Scout, I, we've talked about it recently on the show. It's got a like a light circus theme that I really enjoy in this game, even though it is very abstract and light. Uh, it It's just a fun game for me. And when I was going through ranking these games, it's funny to compare something like Scout against something like Brian Brew, because Brian Brew is on my list as well. But Scout just kept coming out ahead as something I'd be happy to sit down and play and probably further down the list again because it's a lighter game. But yeah, I I love Scout. Can't wait to go back to it some more. I don't blame you one bit, Tim, because Scout is my number 36 on my list. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's our first crossover at the same number. Wow. Am I ever? Right. It's uh, the only things I can add besides what Tim said is designer is K Kajino or K Kajino probably. And, um, like you said, it's a, a master of the short game family variety. Take it out, get it going. Around the round, around you go. Oh, let's run it back. Let's play it again because this game is tons and tons of fun. Uh, that's Scout. Also, my number 36. I will confess that I enjoyed this game way more than I ever thought that I would. And it was one of the ones that I threw in the mix for my own list. And I was actually sad that it didn't come up higher on the list because it is a fun, clever little game. So good, great choice. I think that's a really good game to have on your list. You know, it's got to be good if Chris isn't hating on it. And it's just an abstract card. You, you know, if Chris is not <laughs> hating on it. Yeah. Uh, my number 36 was another game that grew on me over time. And that is Space Base, which is new to my list this year. It was designed by John D. Clare and is published by AEG. This game we've talked about quite a bit in the past, so I won't go into any detail. Uh, Essentially, it's just a straight engine builder where you roll dice, and then based on the roll of a dice, cards that you amass and place in your docking stations, you're either going to get the a certain bonus if you roll you're the one rolling the dice or if your opponent rolls the dice then you're going to get a different bonus but you're going to get a bonus basically for every card that you have out there based on the dice roll and it's picking the right cards to combo up with the other right cards and to fill in the right spots and you know engine build engine build engine build super simple super fun i wish that it had more engaging art the art on this is is pretty un fun in in my opinion I, i hate to say it uh, very cartoony and and basic, but it, <laughs> not a, not your basic, your basic, uh, not enough to to mess this game up. The game is still a lot of fun, and the thing that I like about this game best is that it is straight engine building. I love engine building, and this is just nothing but engine building. So if you like that, this is a great game to try. And uh, it's also one that is available on BGA, which makes it easy to play and lots of fun. So I've been playing a lot of games on there. I'd probably be less likely to pull this one out with all the fiddliness of the cards, I think. I, I think it's fiddly. I know that Tim doesn't necessarily agree with that as much. But BGA makes it a great, fun, quick play. Uh, and that got it to number 36 on my list. I love Space Base, both in person and on Board Game Arena. 
And I'm so disappointed. I was like ranking this and this is where pub meeple failed drastically because it ended up at like 97 on my list. But I wow. know that hmm. there's a lot of days where I'd rather play this than almost anything else. So it's just I think it's one of those games that when you're comparing it to something like game night, full night game, it just didn't quite match up for me because it feels a little bit more like a filler almost. I love space space. So Chris, great choice. By the way, I think AEG right now is doing like a big expansion Kickstarter and space space has a new expansion. on uh, here. So I got I haven't had a chance to go and look at the page yet, nice. but I'm going to go check it out and I'll probably end up if I don't back it, I'll pick it up when it comes to retail for sure. Just quickly on space space. It's been climbing up for me a lot too, Chris. I've been playing it on board game arena. I think that suffers a little bit. A lot of times I don't want to read the card to see what the whole thing says. I'm just like, that's oh, too many <laughs> words. I'm just going to do this other one. <laughs> yeah. But uh, also I've started to read those and I've started going for the 10, 11, 12s. Really like ridiculous 10, 11, 12s. Why would you ever do that? But there's some cards where you can transfer. So a lot that I'm discovering here and having a lot of fun with space space as well. That's a fun pick. Nice. Chris. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, my number 35 is Res Arcana. This is a Tom Lehman game. I think it ended up in my top 20s last year. So still a fun game for me. I love this game. It's a simple little fantasy themed engine builder where everybody starts with a deck of eight cards. That's it. Eight cards. And yet you're going to start with three cards in your opening hand. You're going to take turns playing them. You're going to either discard them for a resource or if you have the resources, you're going to play the card out and you can activate the card that you've played. And the goal is to kind of buy up some cards in the middle that are worth points or kind of build your engine even bigger. And it's a quick little game. It plays the 10 points for everybody. I think this is kind of well known as a better two-player game, but it can be interesting and fun at three or four players as well. I like Res Arcana a lot. The problem with it, I think, and why it falls a little bit lower for me, even though it's got amazing artwork, even though it's got a fun mechanism set, is that turns can be so minimal. You don't get to do a lot on a turn oftentimes. You, all you do is you tap a card and get a resource. And so when I'm teaching this to people, I always feel guilty of like, I can't imagine why anyone's going to enjoy this, even though I enjoy it. And so I just don't teach it to as many people as I should probably try it with. But this is a game that's in my collection. I've got all the expansions for it. I got to get it out more often. Uh, and I really like Russ Arcana. It's always fun for me, whether it's in person or, again, on Board Game Arena is another great great way to play it. Yeah, Russ Arcana is a weird one for me, Tim. I, I don't know what it is. There's something. It should be cool. It seems like a quick engine builder and you get to do some fun stuff and drag and fight and this and that but there's something about yeah not being able to do enough on the turns or the taking a while to have to build up before i can buy the fun card to get it in play i don't know there's something that just irks me the tiniest bit about it even though i should love it because it's a cool well-designed game my number 35 is one that's fallen for me over the years but i still love it it's terraforming mars by jacob frixelius and Fricks Games. Back in 2016, right when I was kind of getting into board gaming, I had a lot of time on my hands at that point and played this game over and over and over in person. Got to know the combinations. I went through a phase of, okay, this game's all right, to I don't really want to play it, to let's play it again. Let's play it again two, three times a day. We'd play this one on some days. Got to know it so well. Love seeing the planet Mars build up with these oceans and these forests and these cities and Oh, I'm going to drop a nuke right next to your city over here. I had to just well, heat up the planet a little bit. Sorry about that. Or this giant asteroid gets towed into your city. How brutal. It's just some ridiculous things that can happen. Enough fun. The take, it can be a little take that but it's enough fun thematically to be like, whoops, we miscalculated where that was going to land. It's suffered. It's dropped a little bit because I haven't gotten it to the table that much. I always have a fun time playing this one, though. That's Terraforming Mars. My favorite thing about this I think now it's the nostalgic retro feel, the memories I'll have playing this on June gloomy type of mornings, which is happening right now in Long Beach. It's going to bring me back there to having some nice calm mornings playing this board game just repeatedly in a way that put me in a Zen sort of state. What a great game. And one of my gateway games, one of the first ones that I ever bought when I started playing with Tim. And I can't imagine whether this one might show up on my list at some point. I guess we'll find out. We'll see. I can't mm-hmm. imagine how it could be this far down on anybody's I list, know, to be honest. I know, I know. <laughs> glad to see it's on there, at least. <laughs> so my number 35 was another new one. This is Terracotta Army, which is designed by Premislav Fornal and Adam Kopinski and is published by Board and Dice Games. This is another one that was a one-only play for me. In the past, I've done like Tim did and pulled off some games that I'd only played once. But this year I said, you know what? 
I, I'm going with vibes. If it was vibey to me and I'm thinking about it and I want to play it again, then I'm going to leave it on the list and, and I'm going to let it let it fall where it may. And this is one of those games. It's actually been long enough ago that we played this and did our review of it that I don't remember a lot of the details of this game, but I do remember the vibes. And I remember having really good vibes about this game. Basically, what you're trying to do is populate a mausoleum in the, the ter- with the Terracotta Army, as suggested by the name. And you are putting out statues. You are craftsmen. You're trying to put out the most and best statues within the mausoleum. And the mechanism for uh, placing your statues and doing uh, the various other things that you're doing in this game is this funky little three layered wheel where each layer turns and lines up different actions. And then you place your, your worker on the outside of the ring and you take whatever actions uh, happen from the outside to the inside. So some, some neat stuff going on there. But the reality is, like I said, I don't remember a ton about this game, so I, I can't say exactly what my favorite thing was. So I guess I'm what I'm going to say is my favorite thing about this game is it left me with a really good feeling and a really strong desire to play this one again. It just hasn't come back up in any... I, d- do either of you own it? Tim, did, you thought maybe you were going to get it. Did you ever end up getting it? You know, I was planning to, and I never I never ended up picking up. I was hoping to get it played at our last convention. And I, never, I never pulled it up. And it's funny that you mentioned this, Chris, because... I was thinking like, why didn't this show up in my ranking at all? And I guess I never rated it. So it just didn't oh, pull over oh, my man. board game geek list and I wish it had. But yeah, this is a this is a great game. And no, I, I don't own it, but I would love to play it again. Where do you think this would fit in your top whatever, Tim? I, you know what? This game reminds me, we played this and Lacrimosa really close together. Both games that I liked a lot that were doing interesting things and I wanted to go back to. And I think Lacrimosa ended up somewhere in the 50s. And I bet this would have ranked mm. about the same. Okay. And it could, again, it could either go, it could go higher for sure with more plays or it might get stale. I'm not sure, but I definitely liked playing it and, I, and I'd like to try it again. Okay. So, you know what? This one looked pretty neat. The more I go back and think about it, that row and column stuff was kind of neat. The way you can mani- yeah. manipulate that and those, those cool horses with the, I think is a, a rider shooting the bow and arrow or some point that whichever way the shield is pointed or the guy's arrow was pointed would get you the most points. I thought that was a pretty neat mm-hmm. thematic tie in as well. Plus Adam, I know how much you love worker placement. So it feels like a perfect fit for you. <laughs> is it, is Terracotta Army's worker placement? Yeah. Well, it kind of, there's like this, this action selection wheel that you place a worker on on the outside and you get all the benefits That's right. in the wedge. So, That's but right. yeah, it, it is worker placement. That's yeah. With a twist. I, is, if there's worker placement with a twist, that can work. You might like the twist. All right, cool. Well, yeah, the Terracotta Army is a great reminder. We, sh- we got to get that one back and, and play it. So, so many great games out here that we don't get a chance to play enough. My number 34 is Paladins of the West Kingdom. This is a Shem Phillips design uh, designed by uh, published by Gar- Garfield Games. Paladins of the West Kingdom is my highest ranked Garfield Games game this year. Last year, up in the 20s somewhere, or maybe teens, I think, I had Viscounts of the West Kingdom. And I've gotten a decent number of plays of both of these. And Viscounts has has faded a little bit. The, it's a very unique game. It really stood out to me originally, but it's gotten a little redundant. Paladins, on the other hand, does feel pretty timeless to me. I feel like I could go back to this game anytime and enjoy it. And it's one of these games that I was talking about when we mentioned Revive, where you're just going around, everyone's taking an action, and you've got a few specific types of actions, but you're always trying to push that one out. What's one little bonus thing I could get? And there's some fun engine building Lots of lots of different cards you can purchase to kind of make your engine a little bit better. So Paladins is very exciting, very fun for me. And as I was ranking it against a lot of other games, I kept saying, man, I want to get back and play Paladins again. I do have an expansion for this game and I haven't had a chance to play it yet. And I'm excited to see what the expansion does because I did feel like the base game, even though it had some great unique card uh, engine building in it, the base actions felt like it was going to get a little bit stale. So I can't wait to try. It kind of adds two more actions to the game. The expansion does I want to get back to this some more. This could rise or fall on my list. I think either way, but either, either case, I'm really still excited about Paladins of the West Kingdom. I think it's very clean. I think it's a really strong Euro design that uh, I want to play around with some more. Another Garfield game that, that cropped up when I was doing this pub evil ranking, Tim was circadians chaos order. Did that come anywhere close on your top? It did, but again, it was a, a game we only played one time. And yeah, my biggest concern with Circadians, which I liked a lot, was the drastic asymmetric asymmetry, uh, you know, between the player, which means it's hard to get to the table. It's hard to teach people, 
and the length of game. I remember that being a very like a three and a half or four hour game. And I don't think that gets a lot shorter. So Circadians fell at number 82 for me, even though we only played it the one time. So yeah, very exciting game, game that I, I yeah. you know, like if I had unlimited time, I'm sure it would have gotten more plays and we really would have dug into it some more. But as is, because of the length of time and because of how hard it is to teach, I just can't see that one coming out too much. Paladins, on the other hand, I think yeah. is is a, a bit more approachable. Interesting. Next up for me, my number 34 game is Brass Birmingham. This is rated number one by Board Game Geek users at the moment. Designed by Martin Wallace, among others. Gavin Brown's also listed and Matt Tolman, published by Roxley Games. A beautiful production here, especially if you have the poker chips playing with those. It's fallen for me over the years, I guess. I think the theme and the flipping of these tiles, yeah, that's kind of neat a few times. But honestly, there's a lot of other new things in board games that I enjoy doing more than this kind of rat built route building. And while I think it's a fantastic game, I think there's more that's standing out for me as I go into some of these other games. And I, I think this one is starting to get the slightest bit of stale for me, which sounds surprising <laughs> that I say that because I've had so much fun with it. I still love playing this one. That's Brass Birmingham. I think I get what you mean though, Adam. I played it once and really liked it and then played it the second time and it felt stale to me already. So, but I will say this, that it is one of the few games that actually requires beer to take an action. And that's actually pretty cool. That's pretty neat. So here's to that. Well, my number 34 is another new game this year and another one that is a uh, very recent play for us. People are probably need the impression that I was being lazy and just looking at all the games that we played recently and add them to my list. But my number 34 was Downforce, designed by Rob Davio, Justin Jacobson and Wolfgang Kramer and published by Restoration Games, which we just reviewed a couple weeks ago. So if you're interested... We did a review of this game and Heat, Pedal to the Metal, on the same evening. And we had some pretty strong feelings about these games. And this was the winner of the two, we thought, between you know, the two big racing games that are very popular right now. And this is one that I was enjoying it as we were playing it. And every day that has gone by since I played this game, I have just been thinking about it and thinking about the goofy fun and the Playmobil playmat, you know, board that you're using for this thing and these little plastic race cars. And it was goofy, silly, fun, but so enjoyable with a few interesting decisions to make. You're starting out with this crazy auction for the cars and then you're betting on the race and you're in the middle of the race and you could win the game by betting on somebody else and not even winning the race so lots of fun stuff happening super quick game and i think the thing that is my favorite about downforce is the accessibility of it that it is a super duper fun game and it would probably take you 10 minutes to teach it to somebody including you probably play this with your know, relatively young children. BGD rates is at 10 and up and the community says eight and up, which I think is probably right. But it's got enough interesting decisions to make for someone who's serious about gaming to enjoy it. But it's simple enough that you could play it with pretty much any crowd, I think. And I love that. Chris, you remind me how much I loved it. I just literally bought it on Amazon while you were talking about it right now because nice. I, <laughs> I, you know, I was <laughs> like, there's a few games where I just keep thinking about too. And Downforce is one of those. We've only, you know, it was a week ago or a week and a half ago that we played it for the first time. I wouldn't, I, I did my ranking before we even did that episode as well. So I wouldn't have been included there. But man, I had fun playing that game. And I think it's a game that we're going to get a lot of fun out of. Will it last forever? Who knows? I don't care. I'm going to try it for 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just bought it and uh, we get some more plays of it. It. I've, I've, I've been playing with a, a kind of a more casual group lately. Some some friends of my wife, uh, you know, got introduced to through some group. And uh, we've been playing a lot of kind of casual games. And it's a group of five to six people every time. Like Downforce is such a great pick for that. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to play it some more. Great pick, Chris. Great pick. Fant I have to chime in here too. I'm going to be talking about this one in next week's episode. Hmm. Absolutely had so much fun playing this game. You nailed it, Chris. I've been thinking about it every day since we played it. Just how goofy it was, how fun it was. There's little, yeah, the cheapy plastic race cars that are worthless, but it's going to feel so <laughs> fun moving those things up the track as they go on. Great pick with Downforce. All right, my number 33 is a 
the the freshman game published by Jamie Stegmaier, designed by Jamie Stegmaier, published by Stonemaier Games, the very first game that they ever published. And this is Viticulture Essential Edition. Of course, the Essential Edition was kind of a revised, like maybe a second edition of the game. But uh, Viticulture is a worker placement game. There's a lot of worker placement games out there. Viticulture does some things really fun and really unique, namely that there is a order of the way you've got to do things. And there's it's tight worker placement, but if you get there first, you get bonuses. Love bonuses. It's very card-based. There's four different piles of cards. You've got this random stuff that's happening, these visitors, the orders you're going to fill, the types of grapes you're going to be working with. It's fun worker placement for me. I always have a fun time going back to this. It's wonderful to get to the end of the season and get to age your wine and have all your stuff, all these little marbles move up on your board. And I think Viticulture gives you a number of ways to play. Essential Edition's great. Tuscany, what a wonderful edition of the game. I don't even think you guys have played it yet, uh, but it, it just really evolves the game in a way you haven't even experienced yet. If you like the base game, it just it adds so much more fun and interesting things. And then Viticulture World, which just blows the game up Unfortunately, it's co-op, but as a solo game, it's great. Even co-op, it's great. Mm. But some of the stuff it does, man, I wish they thought about it in the base game. Viticulture has a lot of ways to play it, but they're all fun for me. So Viticulture Essential Edition is number 33 on my favorite games. Such a great game. I, I love this game. Awesome choice. Yeah, I'd love to try this. Uh, I think it's the Tuscany. Mm-hmm. Said, yeah, yeah, Tuscany. Yeah. Yep, yep. Up um, next to me's game Chris already brought up tonight. He, I'm talking about Can't Stop what a fantastic game this implementation on board game arena i'd only heard people talking about it now i get to play it and it's so ridiculously fun my favorite part is the whole probabilities of it all so i like you know moving up getting a lead and then my favorite part is thinking about "Mm, this position that i'm at right now how much pressure is that going to put on chris to try to to try to catch up to me is it going to be just enough pressure to get him to do that one extra roll where he's gonna bust you know how far back is tim if i stop right here how much pressure is i going to put on the guys behind me so that's another just a small decision i like to take into account when i'm playing can't stop what a fun game i am literally inviting you guys to a game of this as we're sitting here talking (laughs) so take take your first turn after the episode's over (laughs) a great choice obviously adam i'm just delighted to see can't stop showing up on two of our lists here um which brings me to my number 33 which is one that i i almost am reluctant to put on there because i've been assassinated by Adam at this game so many times now. Um, It's Azul, designed by (laughs) Michael Kiesling and published by Plan B Games. Such a classic. It is such an elegant game. It probably, I probably no need for any explanation because I'm guessing anybody who's listening to this podcast has probably played or is familiar with Azul tile laying, trying to make uh, patterns Uh, patterns of tiles and then scoring based on rows and columns so this game is as simple as can be and yet is so deeply strategic adam has this master spreadsheet that i've heard of he won't show the it's like the you know the secret ingredients and you know the kernel secret ingredients for kentucky fried chicken that uh you know lets him win this game all the time but it is a a wonderful game that has been re-implemented many times or i mean not re-implemented is the wrong word but there have been multiple uh, variations of this game published since the original, the OG Azul, and none of them that I've played have come anywhere close to the original. So I say stick to the original. It is an absolutely awesome game. And the thing that I like best about Azul is the simple yet elegant production of this game. And of course, the game itself is great. The play is wonderful. But you have this simple board with these big chunky tiles that feel so good to pick up and put in the right places, putting, you know, putting your hand in there into the bag and drawing out the next round of tiles. It feels so good. Uh, and yet is, is so simple. Uh, and I think that makes for a, an elegant and delightful game that made it to number 33 on my favorite games list. Great pick. Azul is fun. Um, this is another game that I have a, just an ongoing game going with my brother and his friend, Brooke. And so it's it, I literally probably hundreds of plays of this. And at this point, it's starting to feel a little redundant. So it didn't end up on my list. But I, I, this is one of those rare games where the very first time I played it, I bought it. The, the second I played it, like I finished the game 
And I was like, Amazon shipped to my house. I need to own this game. Have had a lot of fun with this game over the years. We'll be happy to play it any time. But maybe not tomorrow again after the 30th play this week. <laughs> my goodness. This one you'll be hearing about, I'll be talking about in two episodes from now. I've had, I've got a very deep on his, I've gone off the deep end on Azul and <laughs> I absolutely love this game as well. There was a time period. If you go back and listen about six, maybe a year, six months or a year ago that we're, we're Adam just like, that's all he talked about every episode. They ended up, I got to talk about my latest Azul. This week. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, my number 32 is Teotihuacan city of gods. This is a moderately heavy Euro that was just becoming popular, right? As I was really getting into the hobby, I think it came out in like 2018 and I just remember I'm following Board Game Geek and it's just on the hotness for several weeks. And I kept looking at it and I wanted to buy it so bad. But my local friends that I just started pulling into the hobby, I was like, man, I don't want to force them into this big, heavy game. So I didn't end up buying it. Probably the right decision at the time, but I'm so glad I own it now. And I'm so glad I've gotten a lot of chances to play it, both in person as well as on Board Game Arena. I love Tay Talk and I love the decisions of it. It's a dice movement game there's a rondel basically your action space are rondels you move dice around as you move them they level up the dice get more powerful they do better actions but they also get more expensive to feed and eventually they die and so then they start small again so it's fun choices about which spaces you're going to as you get multiple dice on a space they do more powerful actions it's a euro game there's tracks there's dice there's chunky decisions there's spreadsheets on every action space you can go to about what benefit you get from it we talked about this recently on our sedona con episodes you know chris and i loved it you know adam did not enjoy it very much but i am still loving teotihuacan and city of gods and uh, happy to go back to it this is number 32 for me yeah this is one of those games i think it's a great game i think our brains just enjoy the different puzzles so yeah. you like the puzzle of this one my brain i recognize that the puzzle is there and it's a an interesting puzzle if your brain's keyed into that mine has soured on that just a little bit lately it's interesting to see it's interesting i don't know it's cool <laughs> i have been forgetting to say what my favorite thing is so let me call it out on teotihuacan city of gods my favorite part about teotihuacan is the variability in this game and the fact that like you can literally set up the game where the board is the action space are in different places and the bonuses you get for moving up every track is in different spaces and that may, that may not seem a lot, but I think for a game of this scope, like that really changes the game every time. And I always feel like it's a different puzzle, even though, it, to be honest, it doesn't feel that complicated to play. So I like when a game really can, you know, you could have just left it the base game board and every time you're playing in the same order, but they right out of the right out of the gate, they said, we can, we're going to let people play this game infinitely and it's always going to feel different. And I like when games do that. Well, my number 32 game is a game that only played once, Breaking Tim's Rule Again. This is Lacrimosa. This was designed by Gerardo Cinci and Ferran Ronales, and the publisher is Devere Games. has been having some fantastic games. But you look at this game, you see the box covers, dramatic composer on the front with his eyes closed, very in tune to his music. It's striking. And you get into the gameplay, and it's a fantastic Euro-style game in Europe. But it has this piece where you're composing music along the bottom among many other fantastic pieces but i think that's my favorite part of this game is the the battle for composition majority that you're going for with the two different composers and the instruments and which movement they're going to play it so that's my favorite part of this about this game a euro game with a fantastic theme lacrimosa this game has got the weirdest area control, area majority of any game I've seen in that. Love it. I, I did yeah. too, which makes me wonder how come Adam couldn't get behind the stamps in Darwin's Bury. I don't <laughs> right? know. Who totally. knows? It's like the same thing. Totally different. <laughs> but a great choice nonetheless. Um, my number 32 game, yet another one that we have talked about fairly recently, this one in our Sedona Con episode. This is Pan Am, the board game designed by Prospero Hall and published by Funko Games. This one is the first one that is on my list and was also on my list last year in a very close position. It was actually 30 last year. It's dropped a couple spots, which I doesn't actually reflect in any way my love of this game or a change in my love of the game. It's probably just some quirk of 
the pub meeple or having played more games other yeah having played more games now but this is a game that's about 20 times better than you should expect for any game that you buy at target for like 20 dollars what an amazing game you're buying you know routes you're putting out airplanes you're competing against your fellow you know your other airlines with the hope that pan am the juggernaut is going to come and buy you up and pay you a lot of money for your routes so that you can go and buy new planes and it's uh extremely thematic great looking game very nice production for something that's this inexpensive and easily accessible i absolutely adore this game uh we had a great time playing it at sedona con and so it's very fresh in my mind now with uh, some very very fond memories and i think my favorite part of this game is probably how well the theme is incorporated into this game. And again, I, I, I can't say enough about the production, these nice little planes that look like little planes. And they're not little chits. And this board that has this great map on it that looks reminiscent to something that you would have seen back in the heyday of Pan Am and the cards with their travel poster art on them, you know, looking like uh, you know very old school and traditional. And it's just so much fun to look at. And it, it puts me right in the era and i i just i can't get over how much i enjoy the feel of this game based on that theme and the production so i a true love of mine in this game great pick i think about these things sometimes did you guys ever think about the fact that if the expanse board game had had the same level of production as pan am which is not obviously an expensive production it's not an expensive board game how much did that would have elevated that game like that's all you need it's not even like it's just thin card stock some little simple plastic minis in the expanse board game. It would be a top hundred game for sure. It's crazy. Preach it, man. If they just thrown a little bit of decent art in there instead of like some screen captures from somebody's videotape. <laughs> I mean, come on. You're absolutely right. And it's it's shameful. It's it makes me kind of sad. All right. Well, speaking of great artwork, my number 31 game and the last game that I'm going to talk about this week is Near and Far by Red Raven Games and designed by Ryan Lockett. Near and Far is a game that I got introduced to pretty early in my experience in the hobby. Uh, you know, a friend had backed it on Kickstarter and he brought it to the table and it felt like a heavy teach. He hadn't really learned it. So we had to dig through the rule book a little bit. But this game was the first time I felt like, hey, a board game can give you the experience of like a role playing video game, you know, like a, a game where you really are leveling up your character and you're exploring and you're building, you're putting a party together and you're going out and doing these things. And I love it. I love this game so much. I've, I've managed to play through the full campaign in one weekend with my brother at one point, and we had a great time going through it. But you could just play this a standalone game. It's a great little engine builder. It's very Euro, but it doesn't feel Euro because as you go along and move to this space where you're going to just, you know, you're just going to collect some resources, but you got to go through this book and read a little story segment that tells you what's happening and you get to make a choice without knowing what the consequences are going to be. But then you're getting all you're getting from it is your resources and you're converting them in to build like an artifact, but that artifacts a little bit of an engine builder. So it just tied theme in a, into a Euro game in a way that not many designers have been able to do successfully since then. And so far, this is my favorite red Raven game, my favorite Ryan Lockett design. I'm excited to see if the one that I've got back on Kickstarter, which is Sleeping Gods, uh, Distant Skies, if that's going to kind of exceed this expectation for me. But I still love Near and Far. I've had a lot of fun with it. I got, I'm, I'm going to get my local group together to play this at some point soon. My favorite part about Near and Far, it's the building your little adventure party. You're building this adventure party. You got to go to the pub and recruit an adventurer. And every one of them gives you a couple little effects, but you can't build it all at once. You got to be going out there and adventuring. So you're slowly building up this party and every party is unique and everybody's got, got different abilities because of the party you're building. Love that little adventure party building part of it. It, it feels like playing an old Forgotten Realms game on the pc back in 1984 and i just love it great pick tim my number 31 game and the game that's going to cap the list for this week is revive this is one that we played not too long ago we we have a review about it. if you want to listen to our in-depth thoughts i had such a blast playing this game and going back think about it more it's I want to play it more. There's so many cool things going on here. You got this big machine that Chris talks about in the episode and the way he describes it, it's better than I can do it here. So go listen to that. And then something that Tim pointed out, the more I think about it is 
my favorite thing about this game because it's unique and not that many games do it this well or or even come close. And this is how, right, this is actually like a civilization building game. And you can tell that that's happening from the way the board changes from this icy, desolate location to where now those tiles are flipping over and it's a brown, warm piece of land and it's been inhabited and it's growing and spreading. And you can see that throughout this game, how this ice is shedding and the civilization is building up. What games do that? I, Tim, you pointed that out. And the more I think about it, you're totally you're right. That's such a neat way that this game shows that. That's Revive. Such a great choice. I enjoyed this game too. And another one that we may see popping up at least once more. So my number 31 game, my last game of the evening. And I'm going to end the night on one that is first time on my list and one that we reviewed in this last year. It's The Fox Experiment by Elizabeth Hargrave and published by Pandasaurus Games. This is one that I enjoyed so much after the first play that I went out and backed it on Kickstarter. We played it and reviewed it right when it was out on Kickstarter. And I've been eagerly awaiting news for when this one's coming out. There's been some updates recently. I think it's going to be a while, but uh, I'm super excited about it theme of this game, incredibly interesting. Uh, Elizabeth Hargrave always does interesting science-based or nature-based themes in her games like Mariposa's Wingspan, games like that. Uh, This one is about a experiment, an experiment that was being done in Russia. It might actually still be ongoing where they're trying to domesticate foxes. Why would they do that? Who knows? But it makes for a fun story and they were doing it. So she made a game out of it. And so you, this is a semi, I'm called a roll and write. I mean, there's, um, there's some rolling and there's some writing, but you're basically what you're writing is you're you're filling in these traits for foxes that mean they're more domesticated. So floppy ears and the willingness to bark, stuff like that. And so you're trying to breed the most desirable, i.e. Uh, domesticated and human friendly foxes. And then once you do, then you get your points and ability to meet goals. But they also those foxes that you breed then go back into the pool so that other people can recruit them to use for for their next round as breeding stock. And this game was a, a lot of fun. It was relatively simple, but not too simple. It was kind of, you know, in keeping, I'd say, at uh, difficulty level, a challenge level with wingspan. So relatively accessible. And as with all of Elizabeth Hargrave's games, just a fascinating natural world type of theme that sets it apart from so many other games. I think my favorite thing about this game is the story behind it. The game was terrific, but the story was awesome and so unique. And I actually went and read an article in like the Scientific American after I saw this game and played it because I was like, is this for real? And it actually it actually is for real. And it has been written up. Uh, it's interesting. And it's interesting reading if you care to go back and look at it. So I'm dying to get this one. Uh, but in the meantime, I will be happy to place this one at number 31 at the top of of tonight's list you have to admire the genius of a design where you know you're literally like rolling for the best traits on this fox and then that's how you score in that round but then that fox it goes out to the general supply for other people to bid in and yet somehow it's it feels balanced and it works in a way like why do i want to build up this fox that someone else can get but it works <laughs> i've played all of uh, elizabeth hargrave's published designs at this point and they've all been fun they've all felt unique and they've all really tied theme into them. So I I think this is a great example, probably my favorite of her designs, but you know, like all of them have been have had some have had some pretty interesting things going on. So great, great pick, Chris, Fox Experiment. Something I can't wait to see its finished version on and, and you know play on the table at some point. I'm gonna clone your thoughts, Tim. The Fox Experiment, what a wonderful game, the way the traits pass on, genius design, excellent thematic tie-in, uh, Fox Experiment. All right, great. Well, that was our first 10 games of our top 40 games of all time. And uh, we're excited to continue on next week with number 21 through 30. If you enjoyed this show, come back next week and listen for the next 10. Until next week, take care, everybody. Good night, all. Bye-bye.